So hello everyone, my name is Sarah Isinga and I'm the manager of patient programs, research and advocacy here at Lymphoma Canada. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you today to today's conference session on mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, we appreciate those that are able to attend live today to learn more about the disease specific biology and diagnosis of this lymphoma subtype. This presentation will highlight novel research and treatment options that are accessible to lymphoma patients across Canada. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to provide some guidance about the Zoom software for this session. Uh, this virtual software does not allow you to share your video or your microphone. If you have a question, please save it for the aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma Q&A session that follows this presentation. Um, and this is where you can ask your questions to the presenter live. I'd now like to introduce and welcome you our speaker, Dr. Diego Villa. Dr. Diego Villa is a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia and a medical oncologist at BC Cancer, uh, the Vancouver Cancer Center. He's involved in the care of patients with lymphoid malignancies and breast cancer. His research interests include the management of transformed indolent lymphomas, management of mantle cell lymphoma, primary and secondary CNS lymphomas, and the role of PET slash CT in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. He's a local principal investigator for various international lymphoma and breast cancer clinical trials open in Vancouver. We thank you very much for joining us today and I'll turn over the presentation to you, Dr. Villa. Great, thank you very much, Sarah, for the invitation and thank you to all who are listening to this update on mental cell lymphoma. This is one of my kind of favorite lymphomas just because I find it's such, it has such an interesting biology. So first we'll begin with some uh, background on the biology, the staging, uh, and the prognosis, prognostication of mantle cell lymphoma, and then we'll break up treatment into frontline therapy and uh, also talk about options in the relapse refractory setting and some of the emerging new agents uh, to treat mantle cell lymphoma. Before we dive into the basics of mantle cell lymphoma, I think it's important to agree on some terminology, which I will be using frequently throughout the presentation. So just to get everybody on the same page, I wanted to go over two basic concepts that we use in oncology all the time. The first is the concept of response rate. So on the CT scan, I am showing you a scan of the chest. And this particular uh, scan shows a very large mass in this person's chest, shown by this uh, kind of purple dot. So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the extent of this person's lymphoma. Now, this person is going to get treatment, and this mass is going to change in response to treatment. And various scenarios could happen. It could disappear completely or disappear to such a tiny amount that you can barely measure it, and we call it a complete response, or it can shrink significantly, and you can still measure it, and we call it a partial response. Those two together are called overall response rate, and that's generally a reflection that treatment is effective. If the mass doesn't change, we call it stable disease, and if the mass grows or there are new lesions, we call that progressive disease. The second concept is that of survival analysis, and this is the way in oncology we look at how treatment works in the long term. So while response rates are provide a snapshot of response in the short term, we also want to see if those responses are durable. And we can look at that in different ways. So here I have two plots, we call these Kaplan-Meier curves, where we plot some kind of an outcome in the y-axis against time in the x-axis. So for example, on the left, we have something called progression-free survival. And the name kind of says what it, what it, what it means. So at time equals zero years, 100% of people starting a treatment are progression-free. And as time goes by, people are gonna develop episodes of progression or they're gonna die. And then that proportion of patients moving forward diminishes with the passage of time. In panel B, I'm showing overall survival, which is basically looking at death. So at the beginning of a treatment, everybody is alive, time goes by, and then people die. And every time someone dies, the curve falls. So this is an example of a study we did in British Columbia a few years ago, comparing two chemotherapy regimens in mantle cell lymphoma. And you can see that the patients who received the bendamustine rituximab treatment in blue had better uh, progression-free survival and to some degree overall survival compared to the RCHOP regimen that we used before. So this is the kind of methodology that we use to compare treatments. So beginning with the background of mantle cell lymphoma, I guess the first question is how common is mantle cell lymphoma? And the question is, you know, I think it is relatively common. We always say it's a rare lymphoma, but we see it. 
Uh, it's about 6% of all of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So for a province like British Columbia with a population of almost 5 million people, we see about 40 to 50 cases per year. Uh, and so for Canada, that means we see about three to 400 new cases per year. Small, but I would argue significant. A mantle cell lymphoma is a malignancy of the immune system. And when you think about the immune system and where the immune system lives, well, it really lives from head to toe. It lives in all of our organs. So mantle cell lymphoma almost always presents as advanced stage, or stage three, almost always stage four, actually, uh, depending on how hard you look because of the nature of the system where it comes from. Mantle cell lymphoma will almost always involve lymph nodes shown here in green, but it can involve essentially any organ of, of the body. So this is why when we are seeing a patient with a new diagnosis of mantle cell lymphoma, we have to do a number of tests, typically scans, bone marrow biopsy. Sometimes we'll do other tests uh, like, uh, like colonoscopy or a PET scan to, to have a really good understanding of where exactly the lymphoma is. But if you ask yourself another question, which is about mental cell, like what does that even mean in the first place? Well, so as I said, it's a lymphoma of lymph nodes. So what I'm showing in this scheme is one of these lymph nodes, one of these little green nodes that I showed in this slide. So if you take one of those uh, little lymph nodes, for example, the ones in the right axilla, and you slice them, this is the architecture of a normal lymph node. And the key concept here is that normal immune system cells are trained in the lymph nodes to fight foreign things that enter our body like bacteria, fungi, uh, viruses, or even substances. And a lot of the action occurs in these round structures called follicles. And these all have like a shell around them uh, called the mantle zone shown with the red arrow here. So at some point when these brand new immune system cells are being trained, to do the job of B cells, they can become malignant because of errors in their genetics. And that leads to a proliferation of this shell that lives around the germinal center of the lymph node. And that expands those lymph nodes and creates the lymphomas, uh, or at least the lymphadenopathy or the enlarged lymph nodes that we see in mantle cell lymphoma and many other lymphomas. If you look at that under the microscope, you can see it's not that easy, but you can kind of see here how you have an expanded, you can see these lympho, um, you can see a lymph node and you can see these kind of circular structures of different uh, sizes and shapes. And you can see there's a clear area uh, in the middle, that's the follicle, and you can see this expanded dark purple area, and that's the mantle uh, zone of the lymph node full of lymphoma cells. So that's what it looks like under the microscope. And this, I guess, shows you also why we like or where we need large biopsies so that we can be certain about the diagnosis. So that's what it looks like under the microscope. Now, thinking a little bit more about the molecular aspect of a mantle uh, lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma cell. So this is what it looks like. So it's a B cell and it has a cell membrane. It has a nucleus like any other cell. And if you zoom into the nucleus of that cell, um, the hallmark of mantle cell lymphoma is the overexpression of a protein called cyclin D1. And what cyclin D1 does is it regulates the cell cycle, which is what I'm showing in this scheme. So every single cell in our bodies is growing at a particular pace. Think about it. Why do you cut your hair every few weeks? Why do you cut your fingernails every so often? Why do, are you not cutting you know, your liver uh, or your skin? That's because they grow at different paces. So mantle cell lymphoma grows at a certain pace uh, and that is driven by this overexpression of this protein which basically tells the lymphoma cell to just keep going keep going keep going non-stop and if the mantle cell lymphoma cell keeps going keeps going non-stop then you have an accumulation of uh, malignant b cells in various organs of the body and we talked about this a little bit already not only lymph nodes but mantle cell lymphoma also tends to accumulate in the bowel as well as in the bone marrow So this is the, 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 the summary then of the biology of mantle cell lymphoma. The hallmark is the overexpression of cyclin D1 uh, leading to constant cell cycle. It explains the biology of lymphoma. It explains why it comes back uh, after therapy 
uh, it, we reviewed that it's a, a lymphoma of the immune system that almost always it presents with stage four because of its accumulation in organs outside of lymph nodes, particularly the bone marrow and the spleen. And also the cell cycle, uh, not just of any cell in the body, but also of the mantle cell lymphoma changes from person to person. And this is an important point because what it means is that one person's mantle cell lymphoma may cycle or grow at a different pace than that of a different person. So no two mantle cell lymphomas are alike. And this is an extremely important concept uh, in mantle cell lymphoma, especially for those of us who treat patients with mantle cell lymphoma, is that mantle cell lymphoma is heterogeneous. And, and, and this ties into treatment that it's difficult to come up with a one size fits all approach because no two people are the same. So you, the way I think about mantle cell lymphoma is it's a spectrum. You have people with a very indolent behavior on one end and people with a very aggressive behavior on the other end and everybody lives in the middle. And they're very different cancers. So patients with very indolent forms of mantle cell lymphoma typically present with uh, involvement of the blood and involvement of the bone marrow. And you can see mantle cell lymphoma cells floating uh, in the peripheral blood. But even though that sounds a little bit scary, it turns out they don't do a whole lot. They just float around. And that's something called the leukemic non-neural variant of mantle cell lymphoma. Again, the name says what it is. It's a leukemia, which, is, which just means circulating white blood cells. Non-nodal means it doesn't form lymph nodes. It's literally a leukemia. So it's cer cells circulating in the blood, accumulating the bone marrow, maybe in the spleen, but that's about it. And patients can live with this for many, many, many years, and it has absolutely no impact on their quality of life, on their immunity, on their ability to make uh, cells. But as those mantle cell lymphomas exist and they slowly build up, they can develop mutations and they can turn into a more fast growing or a more aggressive form of mantle cell lymphoma. On the other end of the spectrum, we have very aggressive forms of mantle cell lymphoma, which may, many of you may have heard the names blastoid or pleomorphic. And what that means is that when you look at them under the microscope, those B cells have very aggressive features they tend to be resistant to treatment or they respond briefly to treatment and you know, soon, shortly after you finish treatment, they grow again and they're generally associated with a poor prognosis. The majority of people I see with mental cell lymphoma live in the middle uh, and that's something we call a, a classic mental cell lymphoma. Well, how do people do in general with mental cell lymphoma? So this is a look at British Columbia cancer uh, data and what I'm showing you here is our 40 uh, year experience treating mantle cell lymphoma in British Columbia. And, and we have introduced different treatments with the passage of time. So in blue, the lower curve are kind of our older patients when we all we had was chemotherapy. Then we introduced trituximab and stem cell transplants. And in the last almost decade now, we've had newer agents such as bendamustine and BTP inhibitors. And you can see how as we improve our treatments, overall survival uh, has improved. I, I, I would say on one hand, this is great. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of room to improve survival here. If, if the median overall survival is only seven years, uh, in our current era, I, I, I would argue we have a lot of work ahead of us. One of the challenges we have when we see a patient at the beginning is trying to estimate what their survival is going to be. And I think that's a, that's a very fair question that patients ask is, you know, what is my survival? And it's a very difficult question to answer because of the heterogeneity of mental cell lymphoma. There are some tools that one can use to estimate survival. And the mental cell lymphoma international prognostic index or the MIPI is perhaps the most common one. And it's a very simple uh, way to estimate prognosis. So what you do is you take the age, the performance status, and a couple of blood work parameters, the LDH and the white blood cells. And you can see in the table at the top kind of what the cutoffs are. And you get points for, you know, whether, you know, for different categories of these variables. And then depending on the number of points, you assign a risk, so low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk shown in the table the bottom and that gives you an estimate of how many people are alive at the five-year mark. So that's helpful. Uh, it's not obviously a crystal ball and you have to be very careful with these numbers, but it gives you a sense of how a person might do based on these parameters. But notice how 
These parameters, for example, don't include other things that we know are associated with prognosis, such as having a blastopleomorphic uh, variant of mantle cell lymphoma. But again, it gives you a ballpark. And this is kind of what those numbers look like when you convert them into Kaplan-Meier curves. So in blue, you have low risk. In orange, you have intermediate risk. And in gray, you have high risk. And you can see how it, it, these curves are separate enough that you can come up with different categories where people uh, live uh, different or, or groups of people live um, differently depending on these variables. So, so it's helpful. And the, the other way that you can estimate prognosis then is not to look at clinical parameters, but rather to look at biological parameters. And this is data from British Columbia, where uh, we actually took biopsies of patients with mantle cell lymphoma and looked at the expression of different genes using nanostring technology. And you can also come up with three groups of patients with a distinct prognosis, independent of what I showed you with the MIPI. Uh, and so this is helpful in the sense that it incorporates biology. And in a way, it's nice too, because it also accounts for the biologic heterogeneity uh, from person to person. But I think you kind of have to marry not just the clinical bit with the biological bit. But I think to me, the biggest thing is how do people respond to treatment? And that's something that's very difficult to predict uh, up front. But that's what we have. So how do we treat people with mantle cell lymphoma? Well, the first thing to remember is not everybody needs immediate treatment. So I discussed the leukemic non-nodal patients, which often can have a very indolent course for years. So you don't have to treat everybody up front <clears throat> uh, necessarily. I would say the majority of people need treatment, but not everybody does. This is British Columbia data. Uh, we published this a few years ago. And what we did was we looked at patients with mantle cell lymphoma who had not initiated treatment uh, for at least three months since their diagnosis. And we kind of went into their charts to disentangle the story of what happened with these patients. So on the left, I am showing a curve showing the, 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 the incidence of treatment um, over time. So TTT means time to treatment. And so you can see how uh, these patients at time zero, nobody has started treatment. As time goes by, more and more people start treatment, so the curve begins to rise. So the median time to treatment uh, in, in our hands, depending on how we choose patients for observation, is 35 months, so basically about three years. Uh, but, but that's a median. That tells you half of those patients begin treatment within the first three years, and the other half uh, can wait more than three years to start treatment. But, you know, that also shows you that most people uh, need treatment sooner or later. Now you will see that there is a proportion of patients who never initiate treatment or who initiate treatment much later in the game. And those tend to be those patients with the leukemic non-nodal variant, which I'm showing in panel B, and to some degree, a very rare group of patients who only have involvement of the small or the large bowel, but no other areas of active cancer. So these patients do well. Now, do you hurt patients by delaying treatment? Uh, and the answer is no. So here I'm showing overall survival uh, against time. And so here I'm showing uh, in the dotted curve or in the broken curve, the patients who were initially observed against the patients who required early treatment in the solid line. And this curve shows you that the overall survival of people who were selected for observation is better than that of the patients who were treated immediately. So, that, that doesn't mean that observing someone makes them live longer. It just reflects that those people had a much better biology or a disease that had a more indolent behavior. Uh, and for that reason, they did well. But that's the type of data that we use to justify observing patients. I think the other piece of data or the other argument that we make in favor of observing patients whenever we can is treatment does improve with time. And I have seen this in my career where we have observed patients, treatment is better, and by the time they need treatment, they get a treatment that's potentially more effective or a treatment that is less toxic. Now, outside of that, most patients will require treatment. And, and this is the current algorithm for treatment. And, and so if you kind of start, if you start at the beginning, you have a patient who needs treatment, the first thing you have to do is you have to assess their age and their comorbidities, and that will help you figure out what to do. So the, about half of the patients that we see are 
under the age of 65 or so, and they're generally healthy. So in those patients, you can step up your chemotherapy a little bit more because you know that these patients can handle more intensive therapy. So let's explore first what we do with the younger kind of fitter patients, and we'll explore what to do with the elderly or the less fit patients in a moment. And the, the general rule when you treat a young patient with mantle cell lymphoma is that we're gonna do three things or we follow three steps. The first part of the treatment is to induce a response. In other words, let's, let's shrink the lymphoma. And we do that with rituximab, uh, which is a monoclonal antibody or immune therapy and good old chemotherapy. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to achieve a response, ideally a complete response, but we'll, we'll be happy with a partial response. Now we know that that's not enough. We know that mantle cell lymphoma cannot be cured with what we have, but we know that it can respond really well to our treatments. In the young patients, what we do after induction is we consolidate that response with a really high dose of chemotherapy. This will eliminate a number of leftover cells that are resistant to the induction chemotherapy, but the high dose chemotherapy can cause uh, a number of problems, including wiping out a person's bone marrow and the immune system. So we have to collect their own stem cells uh, before the high dose chemotherapy and give it back to them so that they can recover from the high dose chemotherapy. And that's called an autologous stem cell transplant. That tends to deepen the response. By that point, most people will have had a really nice response and you wanna keep it that way. So you maintain the response with maintenance rituximab and that's typically given every three months for two or three years. And eventually you finish your treatment. So the, the, the pillars here are chemotherapy and rituximab. They have complementary mechanisms of action. They're, they're all intravenous or oral agents largely intravenous or, or, or actually subcutaneous. So rituximab, it's an antibody, it's immune therapy, it attaches to CD20, which is a molecule expressed on B cells. And what it does is it activates the immune system to kill those lymphoma cells, while chemotherapy has its classic mechanism of action of getting into the nucleus of those lymphoma cells and interfering with, um, with cell cycle. Okay, so there are a number of regimens that can be used for the first line therapy of these patients. And these are shown in this table. And the idea is not to show you the granular data, but just to give you a sense of the wealth of data. And these come in various flavors. So some groups use a very complicated regimen called hypersevad, which uses a number of drugs in alternation. Most centers around the world use regimens that alternate two regimens called RCHOP and RDHAP. And some centers around the world use bendamustine-based regimens. Probably the most common treatment for younger patients with mantle cell lymphoma is alternating RCHOP with RDHAP. And again, these are just combination chemotherapy regimens with rituximab. And this is based on a large European study that was published now six years ago. Uh, all of these patients were treated, well, there were two arms in this study. Uh, there was the alternating group versus just RCHOP times six, and everybody was treated with an autologous stem cell transplant. These are the most updated results. This is a study that now has almost 11 years of follow-up. And you can see in blue is the patients who get RCHOP alternating with RDHAP before their transplant and their median time to treatment failure is 8.4 years. In fact, their 10 year time to treatment failure is about 50%. So that's a very helpful number. That means that if you treat hundred patients with the alternating regimen plus a transplant at the 10 year mark, about 50% of those patients are still alive and well, and with no evidence of recurrence of mantle cell lymphoma. That's really good. Again, there's room for improvement, but that's where the bar lives today. This regimen with a more updated follow-up um, is also associated with improved overall survival. So not only does it control their mantle cell lymphoma better, but they also live a little bit longer uh, than the patients who were treated with the other regimens. I think this is probably the most common regimen uh, used around the world based on these data. But as I showed in the table, it's not the only one. And today we don't say that there's a single standard of care. I think it's fair game to use any regimen as long as you use rituximab and a transplant. For example, in British Columbia, we use pendamustine rituximab. So in British Columbia, we don't have the infrastructure for the administration of RDHAP, which requires inpatient administration and is extremely complicated and very toxic. So in British Columbia, we treat all of our patients with pentamastin and rituximab. So this is a study we did over the last couple of years where we compared our experience in British Columbia treating patients, young patients, with pentamastin and rituximab and transplant and maintenance. And we actually compared the data directly to the alternating arm of the German study I showed a moment ago. We shared the data. And what we showed was that there was no difference in outcomes 
Um, so that is not a randomized comparison, but it is a comparison that suggests that you can get your patients to relatively similar places uh, and that perhaps the induction chemotherapy doesn't matter as long as patients get the full package. So I think there are many options that one can use, but the point here for everyone is this kind of three-step approach is what the world considers important. I think the details are important, but they're less important as long as people can get through all of these three steps. Now, going back to our algorithm, what do we do with patients who are not young and fit for autologous stem cell transplant, uh, but they're still fit for some amount of, of, of treatment. Well, so in those patients, we still induce our response with chemotherapy and rituximab, and most patients will respond, but we're not, we're not gonna consolidate with a stem cell transplant, but we will move on to maintenance. So it's the same idea, you just remove the consolidation piece. And once again, there have been a number of studies looking at different regimens, you'll see in the left column that RCHOP is the most common regimen. That's because um, historically that's what was used the most. But we don't use CHOP very much these days. We tend to use bendamustine based on a different study from, from Europe, uh, comparing bendamustine and rituximab against RCHOP in these patients. Now, this study is almost a decade old, but it still influences practice. And what it shows is that that median uh, progression-free survival is about 36 months in elderly patients compared to RCHOP. So not as good as what you see in the younger patients uh, because these are elderly patients are harder to treat, but also because you're not using the consolidation piece. So this is where the bar lives with uh, patients who are not eligible for a transplant. We have also looked at that uh, in our own uh, British Columbia cohort. So here what I'm showing you is a retrospective look at what's been at, at survival uh, in our British Columbia patients ever since we introduced bendamustine in 2003. And what uh, th this is stratified by age. So the first, the, so the top two curves show you um, the younger patients, so bendamustine, rituximab versus RCHOP in patients under the age of 65. And so you see how the younger patients do better. And the lower curves, the green and the purple, show BR versus CHOPR in patients over the age of 65. And again, survival is improved with bendamustine and rituximab. So this pretty much wipes out RCHOP as the preferred uh, chemotherapy. And for this reason, I think we use bendamustine and rituximab across the board. But I would say that is uh, a worldwide standard of care. Now, not everybody responds to bendamustine and rituximab. And uh, in our study, we showed that patients with blastoid uh, mantle cell lymphoma or patients with very proliferative mantle cell lymphoma tended to have poor outcomes with bendamustine and rituximab. But the reality is they have poor outcomes with any chemotherapy that you give them, even if you give them the alternating regimen, even if you transplant them, even if you give them hyper-CVAD. The, the, these these patients with this adverse biology usually don't do as well with traditional chemoimmunotherapy. So step one, I think today is to treat patients with bendamustine rituximab or a similar regimen, and then to follow that with maintenance. Now here, it's been a little bit controversial. Maintenance rituximab after BR was studied in a smallish uh, German study with only 120 patients. So you can see this, the kind of the design of the study here. These were patients who were not, were not eligible for peripheral blood stem cell transplant. They received six cycles of endomastic rituximab. They were randomized to observation versus two years of maintenance. And you can see here how both the progression-free survival and the overall survival curves are pretty much on top of each other. Uh, so there's no benefit to maintenance in this small study. But this study generated a lot of criticism because of its small size. And uh, to some degree, the follow-up was only four and a half years. So many people kept using maintenance and ignored the results of this study. Time went by and a large study was done looking at real world patients. This is a large American study and we contributed uh, some of the patients in the validation cohort for the study. And what this shows, focusing on the red and blue curves, is if you treat patients with BR plus MR, maintenance rituximab in red, 
they do much better than the other categories, including, including r chop plus maintenance for toxin in orange. They do better than BR on its own. And the survival on the right of patients who get maintenance after either BR or r chop is significantly better than those who don't get maintenance. Now, this is great, but you need to remember, this is not randomized. This is real world data. In, in this study, uh, uh, in, in the real world, you, you need to respond to your induction therapy to be eligible for maintenance. You need to survive your induction therapy to be eligible for maintenance. So there is a certain amount of bias uh, through this results and the authors try to account for that as much as possible. So it's hard to know, but I think based on this, most of us feel comfortable using maintenance for toxamab after bendamustine. And that's certainly the standard of care in, in most parts of cancer. So that's pretty much the standard of care today for both the young uh, and fit and the older and the unfit. But the world has moved on and we have a number of novel agents that we can use and we'll go over some of these. And the other part is most patients unfortunately will have a relapse of their mantle cells sooner or later after the frontline therapy. So what are the options then for patients who need a second, a third, a fourth line of therapy? Well, the first thing to say is that there are options, so that's a good thing, and, and the list of options is growing, which is also great. Uh, there is no standard of care. Um, I think most of us would say BTK inhibitors are the standard of care, but that's not necessarily what you absolutely have to do second line. There are You can really choose from any of these items on the list. Now, whether you can access them is a different question, uh, or whether they're appropriate is a different question, but this is just kind of the the, the list of things that I think through when I'm thinking of therapy for second, third, fourth line mantle cell lymphoma. So what I like about these options is that they're not chemo or rituximab. So you think about chemotherapy, it, 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 it um, damages DNA in the nucleus. If you think about rituximab, it binds to CD20 in the surface. Well, wait a minute, but what about everything between the nucleus and the cell surface because the signals need to go from the cell surface into the nucleus. So what about that? <clears throat> How do messages get communicated? Well, it's complicated. So here I'm showing the scheme of what that looks like. So at the top here, you have the cell membrane shown with the tiny little blue dots. Uh, that's the cell membrane. And at the bottom, uh, you can see the little DNA inside the nucleus of the cell. And then you have all these molecules of various colors that are sending the message from the outside all the way to the inside. Uh, so here on the far right, I'm showing CE20. Uh, and then I'm showing other things like the BCR, which is the B-cell receptor. And I think the B-cell receptor is kind of one of the most key pieces in all of this because that's where antigens or where things bind to the uh, receptor of that B cell. And, uh, and there are other receptors. And when, when things bind to these outside receptors, that message is triggered. And well, this is great. This provides an opportunity to create small molecules that diffuse through the cell membrane and can basically block any of these molecules or potentially you could combine them and block various of these molecules at the same time. And the big ticket item in the last few years has been BTK, which is the molecule here shown in red. So you can see how it's close to the cell surface, it's close to the B cell receptor. And so you can imagine that if you shut BTK down, you can shut down all of the downstream signaling that occurs. You could make a similar argument with the other ones up there like PI3K in green um, or even sick in, 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 um, in purple. So if you shut molecule high up, you shut the whole thing further down, but you could also shut uh, a signaling molecule further down and that might work as well. So many of you are probably familiar with these agents, ibrutinib, zanubrutinib, acalabrutinib. This is probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in mantle cell lymphoma of the last decade. Why? These are targeted drugs that block BTK. They're oral drugs, so this is the first highly effective oral therapy. It's not the only one, but it's the first highly effective oral therapy that we have in mantle cell lymphoma. These are capsules and they're taken daily. And currently there are three, or these three agents are approved by Health Canada for use in 
we love refractory mantis on the phone. So in this in this table, I'm showing kind of the, is the very kind of top level data from the various studies looking at these agents in real refractory mantis on the phone. And I'll draw your attention to the far right where you have the overall responses and the complete responses. So over two thirds of patients respond. Uh, the majority of those responses are partial responses. Yes, you can have CRs depending on, on, on the study that you look at, but this is amazing. This is much better than what I can achieve with many of the other uh, items on, on the list that I showed you a, a second ago. You can see that the median progression free survival is limited, but it's definitely better than what we had before. Now, these are similar in the way they block that molecule. So they all block that BTK molecule at, at the exact same si uh, site. But something people are often shocked to find out is that, yes, they block BTK, but these drugs are dirty. And what it means is, yes, they block that particular protein, but they block a bunch of other proteins as well. And that could lead to toxicity. So this is shown here in what we call kinome maps. So each of these kind of big multicolored circle represents what we call kind of the family of all of these different molecules uh, that connect the cell surface and the nucleus. And BTK is, lives in the TK uh, domain and it's the, you can kind of figure out which one it is because it's the same big red dot uh, across uh, the three drugs. But then you can see how ibrutinib uh, targets a whole bunch of other um, prote proteins, uh, calibrutinib and xanobrutinib, perhaps uh, less so. Uh, and this is important because some of the side effects of, of these drugs include bleeding, hypertension, aches and pains, rash, diarrhea, fatigue, and many of these are related to these drugs blocking other of these molecules uh, in addition to the BTK. So the idea is that if your drug binds or, or inhibits fewer of these off-target molecules, the toxicity might be lower. So you're, when looking at these pictures, one could hypothesize, well, maybe you see lower toxicity with a calibrutinib. And that actually plays out when you look at the toxicity tables of the various uh, BTK inhibitor studies. So to give you an example, uh, you can look, for example, at hypertension or atrial fibrillation in the middle. So HTN, hypertension, AF, Atrial fibrillation, you can see how there's a higher percentage of, of these um, adverse events with abrutinib than with, than with the other drugs. But notice how the other drugs are not, uh, notice how Acala and Zanubrutinib are not side effect free. They have a lower toxicity, but it doesn't mean they don't have it at all. So you still need to monitor for these common toxicities, regardless of the drug that you're using. The other lesson from using these drugs is that the earlier you use them in therapy, the better they work. So this is an analysis looking at the various clinical trials of ibrutinib. And the, the, so in, in the left, you have the progression-free survival curve, and the right, you have the overall survival curve. And, and what this is showing you is how many treatments people had received before going on ibrutinib. So in blue, patients that had one line, usually chemotherapy with rituximab, in orange, you have patients who had received two lines of therapy before they went on ibrutinib, and in gray or the, the dotted line, you have patients who had three or more lines. And you can see how if you use ibrutinib after just one line of therapy, patients have better outcomes. So I think this at less has led most of us to consider BTK inhibitors a second line therapy because we know that's where we can squeeze the most mileage out of that treatment. Well, if this is playing out as second, third, fourth line of therapy. Why do you use these drugs as their first line therapy? If they're so active, then why not? Why don't you use them as, as your first line of therapy? And that is being uh, investigated in a number of clinical trials. So here I'm showing you four large clinical trials that are all randomized in patients over, well, in patients who are ineligible for transplants. And um, so one is called Shine and Rich. ACE 308, the BGB study, and there, most of them use a bendamustine rituximab with a maintenance comparator. And then um, they're using different BTKs. You can see how the first two use abrutinib. There, there's one with a calabrutinib and there's one with an abrutinib. And what these studies are doing is they're trying to see how does the BTK work as initial therapy compared to bendamustine rituximab uh, with maintenance. Uh, you can see that some of these combine all three drugs, 
Uh, the last one uses just the BTK inhibitor. Actually, the second one also uses just the BTK inhibitor with rituximab. So I think once these studies read out, we'll have a wealth of information to tell us how do these drugs work as first treatment for mental cell phone. Now, remember, these drugs work best when they're given as continuous oral therapy. So in these studies, uh, the BTK inhibitors continue until progression or toxicity. So presumably much longer than what you, patients stay on the drug much, much longer than when you use it as second or third line therapy. So the first of these has already been presented and that's the SHINE study. This study compared bendamustine and rituximab with maintenance plus ibrutinib versus bendamustine and rituximab with maintenance. We'll focus on the results on the right first. You can see how progression-free survival was improved by almost an absolute of two years, but without an improvement in overall survival shown in the lower curve. And as expected, there were more adverse events in the ibrutinib-treated arm shown in the orange bars in the left, and that's consistent with the mechanism of action of ibrutinib. So this provides a lot of information for us to think about. It shows that ibrutinib is active when you use it as first-line therapy. We were really happy with these results, but this has generated a number of questions, which I have listed here. And I, you know, my, my two concerns are, number one, uh, what do you do when you use up your three most active drugs in mantle cell lymphoma? Uh, what do you do as second-line therapy? Uh, nobody really knows. I think another question is what's going to be the cost of, of therapy to the healthcare system when you treat people with ibrutinib for longer. Ibrutinib is quite an expensive drug. BTK inhibitors in general are expensive drugs. So what's that going to look like for the healthcare system? And also, you know, what is the optimal package? We treat patients with DR maintenance and then with BTK inhibitors, and that tends to buy people a nice stretch of disease control. So how does that look? versus using up all three drugs in one go. I think the, the, the other studies that I showed in the, in the few last slides hopefully will help shed some light. Now, uh, BTK inhibitors are also being evaluated in young transplant patients. So this is a study we're currently doing in Canada where we are treating young patients with RCHOP and the calibrutinib followed by transplant, followed by two years of uh, rituximab maintenance and the calibrutinib maintenance. And so this study will also help see how do these drugs work in the younger patients going for transplant? This study is open in Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec City, and Halifax. We're actively accruing patients. We're almost done with accrual, and I would encourage people to ask about this study, and we're happy to treat people on this study because it is the way to access BTK inhibitors for young patients with mental cell lymphoma in Canada today. All of that is great. The bad news is when patients develop resistance mutations to BTK inhibitors, they don't do very well. Their disease changes, the biology changes after exposure to BTK inhibitors. So this shows the overall survival of patients who um, stop the brutinib for various reasons. And, and you can see how outcomes are not particularly good. Particularly good. You're looking at survival in, in months, you know, a median of a few months uh, at best. And I've seen this also in my practice. The next big ticket item has been uh, CAR T cell therapy or chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. This is currently standard of care in aggressive lymphomas, and it has also been evaluated in mantle cell lymphoma. So this is a much more complicated treatment. The idea is you collect patients' white blood cells and they're sent to a lab where they are engineered. They're genetically engineered to express a receptor on their surface that, first of all, recognizes lymphoma cells really well, but second, the moment it recognizes them, it hyperactivates those T cells to really recognize and kill the lymphoma cells. So once that those cells are re-engineered, they are given back to patients, and then you see what happens. This is the clinical trial that has led to the uh, kind of approval of this therapy. It's a study called Zuma 2, and you can see on the left kind of the, the receptor that is used, and all of this is engineered in the lab. And this study included 68 patients. And the, the, kind of the main point about this study is that these patients were in trouble. All of these patients had received rituximab, all of these patients had received chemotherapy, all of these patients had received a BTK inhibitor, and the majority of them were basically refractory to whatever they received as their last therapy. So these patients were 
in need of a therapy. This is what happened. And so you can see duration of response in the top and you can see progression free survival in the bottom. And yeah, response is actually better when, uh, sorry, the duration of response is better if you respond, <laughs> uh, especially if you have a complete response rate. And in this study, 91% of patients responded and two thirds had a complete response. So these numbers are very, very impressive. And if you are able to get a CR, shown in blue, your duration of response and your progression-free survival is much better than if you don't. That's kind of obvious, but it's nice to see the numbers. And this is a one-time treatment, so it's, it's highly attractive. The difficulty with CAR T-cell therapy is that it's incredibly expensive. It has toxicity. Uh, sometimes people's immune systems get overly activated and we can run into problems. And currently, uh, it is really difficult to access this therapy. Uh, in Canada, uh, but I think this is coming, and I think we will be slowly treating more patients with CAR T cell therapy, uh, depending on basically availability and funding for this type of therapy. We talked about ibrutinib and acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib. There's a new generation of BTK inhibitors called the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, and these are drugs that bind to that BTK molecule in a different way. Uh, and the poster child is this drug called pertubrutinib or, or um, LOXO305. So on the left, I have another kind of map similar to those three uh, multicolored ones I showed you. And what you can see here is that this one is highly selective. You don't see red dots all over the place. It, it's really highly active just for BTK. And the other really interesting thing about this drug is that you don't need a whole lot of it to inhibit uh, the, the, the BTK molecule in the malignant cells. This was studied in a large study uh, called the Bruin trial. And what they did is they took patients with various cancers. They took patients, uh, you can see that in the bottom. So chronic lymphocytic leukemia, small lymphocytic lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and Waldenstrom's rectal populinemia. So zooming in to the mantle cell patients in the middle, uh, whenever you see those bars go down, it means that the cancers are shrinking. You can kind of see that in the, in the y-axis. That's the maximum change in the sum of the product of diameters from base. In other words, their lymph nodes are shrinking when you look at their CT scan. So most patients have a response. Now, to me, the best part about this is the, 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 the dark blue bars, because those are the patients who had their previous BTK inhibitor discontinued because of progression. So previous abrutinibs and abrutinacala discontinued for progression. But with this drug that blocks the exact same molecule, but in a different way, you can overcome some of that resistance. So this is a drug that we are all hoping to be able to access uh, at some point in the future. Currently, you can only access this in clinical trials, but I think this is something we are looking forward to, to using for our patients. And then the final drug that we are looking forward to using in our patients uh, is, is a completely different drug. Uh, it's, so forget everything we just talked about this, think of a totally novel mechanism of action. So this is looking at a protein called ROR1. And I find this fascinating. This is a protein that is expressed in, in, in the fetus as, as, as there's fetal and embryonic development and when you're born it disappears. And cancer cells acquire this particular molecule on their surface. So that's what is being shown here. Uh, so here on the left, you have uh, different types of cancers, CLL, hairy cell leukemia, mantle cell lymphoma, and the dots tell you the percentage of cells that express this. So you can see how the various different types of hematologic cancers express this molecule, but at the very, very, very far, you have the healthy donor that doesn't have it. You can also see this in the little pictures where you have biopsies from normal patients and tumor patients for different cancers, not just lymphomas, but breast cancer, lung, ovarian, colon, pancreas. And you can see this very interesting phenomenon that cancers express this protein, but normal cells don't. This is great. This provides an opportunity for a targeted therapy that binds to ROR1 uh, and brings a treatment directly to the cancer cell and avoids having to treat the normal cells simply because they don't have that target. So the drug that's being developed to target ROR1 is a drug called xylovertamapidotin. And what it is, is it's an antibody as shown here in the left. And 
the antibody binds to ROR1. And that's shown in the little picture on the right. So ROR1 is in the surface of the cell, but you can notice that this antibody has a little bit of chemotherapy or toxin attached to it. So that's shown in the little yellow um, molecules piggybacked to the tail of that drug. And it's a drug called MMAE, and some of you might be familiar with that because that's the same toxin that we use in a different drug called brentuximab vedotin that we use in Hodgkin lymphoma and some non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So this is given intravenously every three or every week. And the preliminary data that we have so far in mantle cell lymphoma is that it works. So this is a similar plot to what I showed with the uh, uh, pertubrutinib trial. So here we have, again, in the y-axis, the change in the dimensions of those lymph nodes, and each bar is a patient. So you can see how not everybody responds, but there are uh, a group of patients with partial responses and complete responses. Um, so this is being investigated in much larger studies and in much larger cohorts and and I think this is coming. This is, I think, is further ahead. Um, sorry, further behind in development. We will soon open a study of, of this drug in, in Vancouver, uh, and we're looking forward to getting some experience with this drug because I think this is a potentially um, good extra agent to have, not just for mantle cell lymphoma, but for many other uh, cancers. Just given its very fascinating biology. So to summarize. Mantle cell lymphoma is a very heterogeneous disease biologically, uh, clinically, treatment-wise. Uh, today, rituximab-based chemotherapy is the initial first-line standard of care with transplant in young patients, um, with maintenance pretty much across the board. BTK inhibitors are the most frequent second-line therapy. Um, I showed you some studies where it's being moved to the frontline setting, and I think they probably will make their way uh, to the frontline setting in a more defined fashion, but we need to see those results. There are several new agents with different mechanisms of action with activity. We talked about other types of BTK inhibitors, CAR T cell therapy, uh, ROR1 inhibitors. And it's great to see that there are drugs with completely different mechanisms of action because that way you can overcome the resistance that has emerged in response to the treatments that you have used before. And this is really exciting, but the sobering piece is that despite these advances, mental cell lymphoma remains incurable today and we still have a long way to go. So thank you everyone for listening to me. I hope you, you learned a, a few key points and I hope to see you again next year and in the breakout sessions. Thank you, Dr. Villa, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we appreciate your thorough review of mantle cell lymphoma, detailing diagnosis, the prognosis and treatment options that are available for Canadians. I would like to direct our audience to attend the live breakout session to have your questions answered live. Thank you, everyone.